Good morning. How many forgot to set their clocks? So I figure it's either uh, didn't set the clocks or you had extra snow to shovel. Yesterday I was getting blamed for um, all the snow that hit, but what I think you should do is say, well, it's awfully doggone blue out there, gorgeous sky, and since I do live in Mexico, I brought it with me. So I'd like to have credit for the blue sky that you now have. Amen? <laughs> so. This is, by the way, it's good. Look at this. Four young ladies over here serving. When I was an altar server, the mass was in Latin. So I had to get all my cues to ring bells and things in Latin. So you got it easy. <laughs> Um, I am, uh, before I get into what I'm going to talk about, I want to tell you that I do have Minnesotan in me. And my great-grandfather was born and raised in Minnesota. In fact, he was a federal judge in the Twin Cities. My grandfather played professional baseball for the Minnesota Twins minor league team. So if you were out and about watching the Minnesota Twins in the late 1918, 1919, 1924, whatever, then you might have seen my grandfather. And uh, my grandmother was born here in Minnesota, and my mother was born here in Minnesota. So I must have some sort of Minnesotan blood, blood running through my veins. I have two tasks this morning, and they are to provide a, um, an overview of the readings today and also to encourage you, inspire you, invite you, cajole you, guilt you, <laughs> being Catholic, into attending the mission, which is tonight, tomorrow, Tuesday, and Wednesday, four nights in a row, 6.30 p.m., right here in the church. Kids, you're invited, bring your parents. Now, I want to say that I am born and raised Catholic. Sometimes people hear me preach, they say, oh, you must be a Baptist. No, I'm born and raised Catholic, and so I'm a cradle Catholic, but I also am Catholic for two other reasons. And I, the reason I stay in the church are these other two reasons, which I'll share with you. It's important to note that when I go and speak in other churches, whether it's other Christian churches, or I speak in synagogues, or I speak in mosques all over the world, I always tell them I'm Catholic, because I'm proud to be Catholic. I am very, very proud to be Catholic. But why am I proud? With all the problems and everything we've had in our church, why am I a proud Catholic? Because my faith has never been in hierarchy. My faith is in the creed. My faith is in the creed which we pray every single time we go to Mass. We pray to I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, the Maker of Heaven and Earth. So I'm not only a cradle Catholic, but I'm a creedal Catholic. And that's where my focus is. So when things are kind of going wrong or people are telling me this problem or that, I just go back to the creed because that's the foundation for our church. Amen? And the other reason that I'll never leave our church is our church has this great admiration and love and upbuilding of Mary, our Blessed Mother. And that's important to me. I love the fact that our church over or above any other church raises up Mary and gives praise to Mary. You see, if God can choose Mary, why can't we? And if God can raise this woman up among all peoples, then we should be willing to do that. So my love for Mary and that my love for the church that raises up Mary is very important. I wish the church would learn to treat all women with the same admiration and respect that they give our Blessed Lady, which I think hopefully they're going to come around and start doing. The fact that we have four young ladies here, bueno. As we say where I live, muy bueno. Uh, so I have two tasks, one to provide a reflection on the readings, and as I said, the second is to invite you to the mission. So the readings. In today's readings, we have three ways that we can grow closer to God during this Lenten season. So this is the first Sunday of Lent. We have our three ways to get closer to God during Lent. First from the first reading is to pray. The first reading from Deuteronomy says, we cried to the Lord and he heard our cry. You see, it was the prayer of those people that brought about their deliverance. It was their prayer that brought them out of captivity. 
But are we praying in our world today? Do you, do you pray? This is my 45th year in ministry. So I've been doing this a long, long time. And I can't tell you how many times people come up to me, married couples, and say, you know, the last time we prayed as a couple was on our wedding day. Are we praying as followers? Wouldn't it be interesting if on the day we die, we're standing at the great gates and Jesus is there and we say to Jesus, oh, I want to come in. I want to come in. And Jesus looks at us and says, well, how do you know? Have you ever taken time to get to know me? <laughs> we have to pray. And this first Sunday of Lent, start this Lent off praying as we've never done before. And sometimes, by the way, it's people like my fault because we'll tell you to pray, but maybe we don't spend enough time showing you how to pray. In reality, praying is easy. Praying is just sharing your thoughts with God, sharing your life with God. I believe that our life itself, everything we do and everything we neglect to do is how we are talking to God. That is our way of communicating with God. That's our conversation with God. I'm a fan of a man named Bishop Fulton Sheen. Do you remember him? Older folks might. Kids don't. He was a bishop in the church on television and radio. He was a star in his day. In fact, they're looking at making him a saint right now. And he told us, for those that remember, to pray an hour a day. And when I was a young person, about 10 or 11, I heard him say that. And since that time, I've tried to pray an hour every day. In fact, I used to in the old days where you would write in your calendar, you'd write the things you had, your appointments. I used to write in, pray, an hour. I'd schedule it. And now where it's all computerized, I still schedule it. I schedule my hour. If going to a meeting or going to a dinner or going to a, a sports event is important enough to put in our calendar, isn't it as important, if not more important, to schedule our time with God? And so I schedule it every, every day. Fulton Sheen was once at a train station waiting for the train, and it was late. So he told his friend, I'm going to go to the church. And so the friend let him go, but the train started to come. So the friend went to find Bishop Sheen. And he looked in the church, and he couldn't see him. But he walked down the, the, the aisle, and there, laid out in a pew, laid out on a pew, sound asleep, was Bishop Fulton Sheen. And his friend started to chide him. He says, you get on television, you get on radio, you tell everyone to pray for an hour. I come find you in the church and you're sound asleep. And Bishop Sheen said, well, I gave God the hour. What he did with it was his business. <laughs> Let's try this Lent to get back into our prayer life, to build up the prayer life. And if you're a couple, pray with each other as well. Pray alone, but also pray with each other. My, the newest character that I perform is Francis of Assisi. Francis of Assisi used to make four or five Lents every year. And his Lents included fasting, but a lot of prayer. A lot of prayer. Francis of Assisi was known to pray so much that he'd burst into tears. Or he'd pray so much that he'd start to laugh. He was known to be praying so deeply that he would roll down and do somersaults down the side of the hill, caught up and lost in his prayers. Is, are we connected to God? Do we try on a daily basis to connect with God? Have you heard of St. Monica? St. Monica prayed for 30 years, 30 years, 30 years she prayed to God for one thing, to bring her son back to the church. You see, St. Monica knew something that sometimes we forgot that God will answer prayers, but it happens in God's time, not our time. So St. Monica prayed 30 years for her son to come back to the church. And after 30 years, her son came back. And we call her son who? St. Augustine. Monica, his mother, prayed for 30 years that he come back to the church. Let us use this first Sunday of Lent to move us in the direction of a deeper prayer life. Kids, adults, everyone, try to talk to God a little bit more as you move forward. The first step to moving closer to God this Lent is prayer. The second, from the second reading, is to believe. 
The reading today said, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. We are saved by faith. But what does it mean to believe? If I were to ask you, do you believe? Would you all raise your hand? How many of you believe? But how do you know you believe? How do you know? In 2009, I had a massive heart attack. And when I was being put out again in the hospital in the operating room to go back into my heart, the doctors told me later I said a prayer out loud. And I asked them, what did I say? And they said that I said, as clear as a bell, God, I'm ready to go. If you want to take me, I'm ready to go. Now, why was that important to me to hear that I had prayed that? Because I've been standing in front of people for many, many years telling you there is a God, there is a heaven, and telling you that I believe it. But in reality, we really don't know if we believe until we're at that point where the rubber meets the road. And when they're putting you back under in an operating room and you're in the middle of a massive heart attack, you don't know if you're going to wake up. So for me to learn, when I was at that place where... For all I knew, I wasn't going to wake up. I believed and I said, God, take me. I'm ready to be with you. To me, that was God's way of giving me my own little miracle. And it made the heart attack worthwhile, if you can understand that. So how do you believe or how do we know you, we believe? Four ways. First, change. Has your life changed? Every single person who came to Jesus their life changed. Some in small ways, a change of thought, a change of attitude, a change of direction. Some, they were blind and, and were able to see. They were deaf and were able to hear. They were lame and were able to walk. Lazarus was dead and came back. So has your life changed? When you say that you're now a follower of Jesus, do you treat people differently? You're a little nicer, a little warmer? Do we treat our spouses a little bit better maybe than, than we did before? You see, the woman at the well, for example, when you read that story, after she came to know Jesus there at the well, the scripture says that she left Jesus and went into the town to come face to face with the people she was trying to avoid. So you know there was a change, right? But it also says this, she left her water jug behind. What does that mean? To me, that means once she realized who Jesus was and accepted Jesus into her heart and her life, she left her water jug. She left her old ways behind. She became a new person. That's what we're called to do, to change, to become new people. When you read about the story of the wise men, what does it say about the wise men when they left? It says they left by a different path. So what does that say? That means to me that when the wise men came, the three kings came and met Jesus, saw Jesus, believed in Jesus, their life took a different path. They took a different road. Ours does the same thing. So the first way we know whether or not we really believe is to look at our own lives and see if we have changed. The second way is trust. Do we trust God? On a daily basis, do we trust God or do we, as our human beings, uh, do we keep trying to usurp God and think that our way is the better way, our way or the highway? Do we trust God? The way you build trust with God is the same way we build trust in any situation, in little ways over time. For example, I have a daughter. I taught her to swim. Any of you who have taught a child to swim, you've done it probably in a similar way. Unless, of course, you're my father. And if you're my father, you throw me in the deep end and say, if you can get out, I'm making hamburgers. <laughs> so, but not everybody's like him, thankfully. Uh, I'm kidding, sort of. But uh, most of you do what I did. You, I set my daughter on the side of the pool, and I'm in the pool. And what do I say? Jump. And what does she say? No. And I say, jump. No. Come on, sweetie, jump. No. I'll catch you. No. But eventually you say what? Trust me. 
Trust me. And what does she do? She jumps. Because you've built trust. When she was cold, you gave her warmth. When she was hungry, you gave her food. When she was frightened, you gave her comfort. You built that trust. Hi, good to see you. And that's what we're called to do with God. In small ways, we build trust with God. And that's what we're all called to do. The third way, so first is, is, is change, second is trust, the third is believe, is, uh, is forgive, 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 forgive. You know, it's sort of an anathema to me to think that we say we believe in Jesus and yet we don't forgive. When he was on this cross, dying, and you know how you die when you're crucified? You suffocate. So he's hanging there, he's been scourged, he's been beaten, he's bleeding, he's in pain, and he's suffocating to death. And does he say to his mother and Mary Magdalene and John at the foot of the cross, does he say, go and get my friends together and avenge me? No, what does he say? Forgive them. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And yet we find it so difficult to forgive. The, one of the lessons, at least to me, with 9-11 was uh, the two things that most people had in common that knew they were going to die, whether they were in the towers or the airplane. And it was this. They connected with God. Whoever or whatever God was to them, they connected with God. What is the other thing they did? They connected with family or friend friends. And there were many stories like this one of the woman in the second tower who was able to get a hold of a phone and she called her sister. She hadn't spoken to her sister in 40 years. And when they got on the phone, neither of them could remember why they stopped talking. Neither of them could remember why they were so angry at each other. Neither one of them could remember why they were unwilling to forgive. All they could do is be on the phone crying and say, I love you, I love you, I love you. Please forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Why is it that it takes us being at that point of our lives where nothing else matters before we realize the two things that really do matter? Connecting with God and connecting with each other. If we truly believe, we have to be people who are willing to forgive. I suspect there are people in this church that know that there are people in your lives that you need to forgive. And why does God want us to forgive? Is it because he needs us to forgive? That, that somehow God is made better by us forgiving? No. It's because he knows we need to forgive. Because if we don't, it eats at us inside like a cancer. It's healthier for us to forgive. In a few minutes, we're going to be praying the Lord's Prayer. There's a little phrase in the Lord's Prayer that sometimes we just gloss over. Forgive us our trespasses, or forgive us our sins. Forgive us our trespasses, what? Yeah, what's that two-letter word? Forgive us our trespasses as. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Let me say it another way. God, God in heaven who created me, forgive me in the same way I forgive others. Think about that. And if we're not willing to forgive, we're asking God not to forgive us. Did you know that in Matthew, right after the Lord's Prayer, there's only one part of the Lord's Prayer, prayer that's reiterated? And it says this, if you are not willing to forgive, then your, your Heavenly Father will not forgive you. Wow. Forgiving is very, very important. So I want to encourage you, as we start this Lenten journey, to make forgiveness a part of this Lenten journey. Think in your heart. Think down to people that you know need to be forgiven. And you're not forgiving them because they think they need to for be forgiven. And you're not condoning whatever they did. You're just saying, God wants me to forgive. I got to let it go. Amen? So, so the third is forgive and the fourth is love. Ways that we know we believe. Love. God, God gave Moses ten commandments. By the time Jesus came along, the Jewish people took the ten commandments and turned it into 613 rules. <laughs> Jesus said, 
So quit focusing on the rules. There's only two. Love God, love each other. And before we laugh at the Jewish people for taking 10 and making it 613, our church has taken two and turned it into 2,000, called canon law. So what we have to do is focus on the two, love God and love each other. But it's so difficult to love sometimes, isn't it? Love isn't always candies and cards and flowers. Sometimes love is tough. I became friends with an actor by the name of Richard Harris. Young kids would know him as the original Dumbledore in the Harry Potter series. Older folks like me remember him as a man called Horse or in Camelot. And um, we were talking one day when he was drunk, which was a good time to talk to him. And uh, we started talking about love. And he told me, he said, Mark, I've seen true love once in my life. It was in a pub in England. And this older couple came in and they sat down and they ordered a bicky, which is like a hard cookie, and a, and a hot cup of tea. The waitress goes off, brings back the bicky and the cup of tea. Richard Harris says, as I watched the man, he took a bite of the bicky and the woman took a sip of the tea. He said, then the man took his teeth out of his mouth and handed them to his wife and she put them in her mouth and then she took a bite of the bicky and he took a sip of the tea. And Richard Harris says, that's true love. <laughs> but a lot of us say, that's yucky. But guess what? There was nothing sanitary or clean about the death of Jesus on that cross, the ultimate sign of love. Sometimes love is yucky. Sometimes love is painful. Sometimes love hurts but we're still called by God to love. Amen? So the four ways to know you believe is your life changed, do you trust, do you forgive, and do you love? So in the last reading today, what we learn in our ways to get closer to God is to serve. It says in Luke, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. Jesus chose to serve God and re reject temptations and the promises of the world. By the way, the last line in the gospel today is very important, I think. It says, after Satan had done all of his temptations, he left for a while. To quote a former governor of California, I'll be back. Satan is saying, I'll be back. Satan never leaves us. Satan exists in our heart and in our mind and in our being. Satan is that voice that we hear that's telling us to do something we know we shouldn't do. When mom and dad said, don't do this, and the voice is saying, do that, that's that part of Satan. Did you know that the, that the definition of Satan from the root word does not mean devil? It means twister of thoughts, twister of words. Every time you hear of Satan in the, in the Bible, whether it's with Adam and Eve or Jesus here in the desert on the side of the mountain, he's twisting thoughts and twisting words. And that's how Satan works with us today. What we have to learn from today's reading is that we're to listen to God and not listen to Satan. To listen to the things of God and not the things of the world. The world does not have your best interest in mind. There was a young boy, 11 years old, he was born without his right arm. And he said to his mom and dad, he said, I'd like to learn judo. His mom and dad said, well, judo is a good sport, but I don't know if it's the best sport for somebody that's missing a right arm. And the little boy did what little kids do. Please, 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 please. Okay, so mom and dad got him with a judo coach. From day one, the coach is teaching him one and only one particular judo move. Week in, week out, month in, month out, for about eight months, one judo move. At the end of eight months, the coach put the young boy into a competition. Do you know he won the first round? He won the second round? He went to the semifinals? He won the semifinals? He went to the finals? He won the finals in the tournament. And he was amazed. He went to his coach, said, how did that happen? How did I win? You taught me only one move. And the coach looked at him and said, yes, but I taught you the single 
most difficult move in all of judo. And the only way for your competition to beat you is to take hold of your right arm. <laughs> you see, the world, if you pay attention to the world, the world sees our problems. The world sees what we're missing. The world sees our shortcomings. The world sees our problems. God sees our possibilities. God created us. The Bible says that he touched us before we were even born and called us for one thing, called us to proclaim the glory of his son. God sees who we can be. The world sees us for the things that we're not. Does that make sense? So those are the three ways we grow closer to God. Another way is to attend events put on by the church. And as luck would have it, there's a mission beginning tonight at 6.30, tomorrow at 6.30, Tuesday at 6.30, Wednesday at 6.30, right here in the church. Every night I'm going to come out in costume and makeup. And tonight I'm going to come out as uh, St. Joseph. And St. Joseph is going to tell you his story. He's going to talk about where he was born and raised. He's going to talk about meeting Mary, about being betrothed to Mary, about how he felt when she told him he was with child, she was with child. He's gonna talk about the trip to Bethlehem, the birth of Jesus. He's gonna talk about the wise men coming. He's gonna talk about the gold, the frankincense, and myrrh. Did you ever wonder what happened to it? He'll tell you. Come tonight, 6.30. He's also gonna tell you about the trip to Egypt and where he worked, how he supported the family. He's gonna tell you about the first prayer he ever taught to Jesus. Would you like to hear that one? Come tonight, 6.30. You'll hear the first prayer that, uh, that Jesus was likely taught. He's going to talk about his death. He's going to talk about things that you've never thought of when you think of Joseph. The next night, Monday night, I'm going to come out as Judas Iscariot. Now, I've been, as I say, doing these for a lot of years. One time after I performed Judas, a man was in Washington, D.C., a man was waiting for me. And he came up to me and he belted me in the mouth. Someone laughed. And I picked myself up. And I said, why did you do that? And he said, how dare you make excuses for that guy? I said, I didn't make excuses, I made him human. Because you know, for some of us, if we see Judas as a devil, it's easy for us to say, well, I will never fall short. I'm not like Judas. But if we see Judas as a human, who has the same issues we do with pride and ego and the other human ailments, we realize if, as Judas failed, so too can I. So I try to make my characters human. On the third night, I'm gonna come out as Simon Peter. And Simon Peter's gonna tell you his story about meeting Jesus. He's gonna talk about following Jesus. He's gonna talk about falling short so many times and going back to Jesus and say, please forgive me. He's gonna talk about his wife. How many, how many had no idea he had a wife? Yeah, very few. It does not mention a wife in the Bible. It does not mention a wife in the Bible. It does mention a mother-in-law, and I've learned you do not get one without the other. So Peter will tell you about his wife and the role she played in the early church, and he's going to take you all the way up to his death. And then the, the last night I'm going to come out as St. Paul. And St. Paul's going to tell you about the persecuting of the Christians. He's going to tell you about his transformation, the road to Damascus where Jesus spoke to him. He's going to talk about being in, in Ephesus and in Athens and in Jerusalem. He's going to tell you his story in a way you probably haven't heard before. Paul is going to share with you how it was to have the scales removed from his eyes. St. Paul is on the, the last night of the mission. So 6.30 every night. This is my personal invitation to you. So I'm ending now with this. As a Catholic, I know about guilt. So if you're going to feel the least bit guilty for not coming for the next four nights at 6.30, if you are going to feel as if you are risking the eternal fires of eternal damnation for not coming to the mission for the next four nights, 6.30 here in the church, kids are welcome then I want to encourage you in your guilt and personally invite you to come and be with us and share the time together. Amen? My prayer is that during this Lent, there's a resurrection in your own life of love, hope, 
peace and joy. Amen.